Going through our daily lives, every one of us is required to make decisions of some kind. While this is generally something that we do subconsciously, every choice is more important than we may realize. Sometimes, the scenario is as simple as deciding what we want to eat for lunch. Other times, the situation is more difficult, potentially making us choose something that will affect our lives indefinitely. Every decision leads to an outcome, and multiple choices eventually bring us down a path we create for ourselves. Will this course be one you can look back on with fondness? Or will karma be breathing down your neck? Welcome back to Vagabond. Vagabond is a long-running manga series by Takahiko Inoue, with its serialization starting back in 1998. The main story of Vagabond centers around the character Miyamoto Musashi, following him as he transforms from an arrogant fighter to a disciplined master. This growth continues all the way into the final chapters of the series, giving Musashi plenty of time to reflect and change. He uses every encounter as a learning opportunity, constantly questioning himself to determine the best path to take. Starting as a character with grand aspirations, he's not alone when it comes to these endeavors. During the beginning of the story, Musashi is among many fallen warriors that failed during the intense battle of Sekigahara. Still known as Takezo during this period, the defeated samurai locates a certain someone he came to the field with. Here, we're introduced to his longtime friend, Honiden Marahachi. By sheer luck, it seems he was also able to escape death's door. Lacking food and motivation, the friend is anything but positive. Things only get worse, as the two are attacked by refugee hunters shortly after. This is where we see the first major difference between these two characters. Matahachi desperately tries to run from his pursuer, but looking over to Takezo, he sees two soldiers being fended off by an unarmed foe. Quickly eliminating one of the men with his brute strength, Takezo proceeds to annihilate the one attacking the defenseless Matahachi. Eyeing the final opponent, it becomes very clear who the true threat is. Moving past this encounter, both men motivate themselves, becoming more confident in their future. They collapse from exhaustion a little later, only to wake up in the home of a duo of lady thieves. Takezo wants to leave right away, but Matahachi has completely changed his tune thanks to the new female company. With the soldiers still pursuing them, the men decide to stay temporarily. The next day comes, resulting in bandits raiding the house. Following the energetic Takezo's lead, Matahachi goes on the offensive as well, wanting to look good in front of the others. While the fighting continues inside, Takezo pursues the captain of the intruders, brutally finishing him off in no time. Concluding his own duel, Matahachi sees his friend in the distance. Being told the leader was no big deal, he continues to be inspired by his companion. Having plenty of confidence now, the two men are ready for anything. Finally killing his first opponents at 17 years old, Matahachi is more than satisfied. Unfortunately, this really goes to his head, as he makes a bold move on one of the lady thieves. In the pitch dark, she asks which of the two is currently there. As she's been interested in the clueless Takezo, she waits for a response. Still being overly prideful, Matahachi lies to her, using Takezo's name. Hearing the familiar voice, this confirms the woman's suspicions. Matahachi gets stopped, being reminded of a very crucial fact. Ironically, this is something he bragged about prior to this impromptu meetup. Matahachi is ashamed for multiple reasons the next morning. Before they get the chance to go their separate ways, the rest of the bandits catch up from the previous night. The two men rush after them before the attackers can get to one of the women at the house. Commenting on Takezo's speed, Matahachi is unsuccessful in matching the pace of his friend. Without even thinking, Takezo rushes into the enemy-filled building, shocking the one left behind. Forgetting to take his sword with him, Matahachi is left outside to contemplate his next move. Despite the idea of stealing a weapon going through his head, he remains motionless thanks to his growing anxiety. As the fight carries on behind him, his biggest insecurity starts to become apparent. He mentally prepares to rush into the fray, only to freeze up once more. Suddenly, 
the woman they were trying to save appears next to Matahachi. Getting a deadly premonition, she decided to leave beforehand, turning out to be a smart decision. The woman then clings to Matahachi, desperately wanting to be comforted. While Takezo battles the entire horde of bandits inside, the other two selfishly make love nearby. With the fighting finished, Takezo searches the area. Coming across a few leftover articles, it appears that the new couple has since moved on. Going forward a bit, Takezo has since been reborn as Miyamoto Musashi. As he wanders around Kyoto, we get reintroduced to Matahachi, now the husband of the person he ran away with. Apparently, he's been living off the money from the other two women all this time. Being more spoiled than expected, the man's wife isn't interested in the meager pay he would get from doing odd jobs. Having nothing to show for his time with them, Matahachi is effectively kicked out, full of regret as he leaves. Thinking of the future he could have had with his fiance, he laments his foolish choice. Coming across the dojo of the Oshioka clan, the man recalls how one of the members was always particularly intimate with his former wife. Still angry about this, Matahachi wants to destroy the place he calls home. It seems he might get his wish, as quite a disturbance is happening inside. Before his hopes get too high, he runs into Denshichiro outside, who wonders what the stranger's business is. Attempting to appeal to the instructor with a hollow gesture, it blows up in his face. Sneaking around to the back of the dojo, Matahachi watches as Musashi's battle situation gets more dire. The brave display continues, inspiring the lone spectator who doesn't recognize his friend. For a brief moment, the bruised man gets his confidence back, wanting to change for the better. This mood doesn't take long to fade, with memories of the past reminding him of his unsavory actions. Matahachi is desperate for another chance, cursing the betrayal that led to this meaningless life. The dojo fighting carries on until Denshichiro challenges Musashi to a duel. Wanting to help the man that filled him with new hope, Matahachi nervously tries to think of a plan. Opting out of a self-sacrificing strategy, the coward runs at the first sign of trouble. While Miyamoto is still engaged in a life-or-death battle, Matahachi is busy sipping alcohol from a nearby storeroom. Remembering the declaration of bravery from his younger days, the drunk man is now unwilling to throw his life away. Making a superficial compromise with himself, the wasted trespasser falls asleep. Unbeknownst to everyone at the dojo, a major accident is about to occur. Matahachi is later woken up by a smoky interior. Thanks to all the booze he spilled, a nearby candle ignited the surrounding area. The smoke spreads to the main room, interrupting Musashi's fight. Matahachi retreats during the confusion, but one of the members spots him as he climbs over the wall. Despite this being a terrible mistake, he unknowingly bought Musashi more time to train. The members of the school retreat, watching the fire grow more fierce. Being in the crowd, Matahachi now sees that it was his friend that took on the Oshioka by himself. He attempts to catch up, instead getting assaulted by a man he shoved to the ground. Musashi wakes up three days later, still healing from his injuries. Unsure of how he arrived at his current location, it's discovered that a certain drunk man brought him the whole way. Shifting back into town, the Good Samaritan is now wanted for arson. Checking on the warrior he brought for rest, Matahachi discovers that Musashi has already moved on with his journey. Hearing his friend being praised, insecurity starts to well up inside of the jealous man. He doesn't have long to think, as he's still a criminal being pursued by the law. He returns to his former lover's place for shelter, sharing new information with them about the former Takezo. This doesn't buy him any favors, being promptly thrown back into the street. With nowhere left for him to go, the lone man leaves town, heading in no particular direction. After Musashi battles Inshin of the Hozoan school for the first time, the story brings us to a castle in the middle of construction. It's here that we see Matahachi again, struggling to keep up with the physical labor. Once again weighed down by past what-if scenarios, the man can't help but overhear more rumors about Musashi. Making a personal vow to himself, the prideful worker is still convinced that he'll become exceptional. Shortly after this, Matahachi takes notice of a nearby samurai. The warrior gives the weak man medicine for his weariness, asking to look out for him as repayment. 
This deal falls through fairly quickly, as Matahachi is too late in warning the stranger. This results in the samurai getting practically beaten to death by the nearby workers. Thinking about the unfairness of life, the useless man gets glared at by the assaulted warrior, leaving Matahachi to grovel as he backs away. The samurai passes on, with the young adult offering to bring his belongings back to his family. A bit of searching reveals a strange object, quickly taken to a neighboring field to investigate further. Finding a scroll belonging to Sasaki Kojiro, it's revealed that he was extremely skilled in the art of the blade. Feeling sorry for the slain warrior, Matahachi is determined to carry out the delivery. Also discovering a large sum of cash, the man becomes even more motivated. Coming to a nearby rest stop, Matahachi starts to gather info on the location of the fallen samurai's hometown. This leads him on a wild goose chase that eventually lands him in Osaka. While enjoying some food, Matahachi notes how many wandering samurai are in the area. The owner mentions how the warriors are necessary for the upcoming conflict, going on to say that certain important men used to be average workers. Finally getting a chance to prove himself, Matahachi is filled with determination. Taking the first step, he heads to a new establishment and immediately starts drinking alcohol. Catching the eye of a fellow samurai, the two share some sake while getting acquainted. After talking back and forth, Matahachi randomly decides to introduce himself as the man on the certificate. This results in an unexpected reaction from the other samurai. The name he borrowed is far more noteworthy than he realized, dumbfounding the liar with its impact. Acting confidently, Matahachi plays up his importance while making it known that he's looking for employment. The other man offers to help him, starting with a pre-celebration party later that night. The next morning, Matahachi's acquaintance goes to inquire about work, taking a recommendation fee along with him. While the fake Kojiro feels slightly guilty about what he's doing, he intends to live up to the new reputation. Waiting for the samurai to give him good news, Matahachi hangs around the area for quite some time. Talking with the owner of the place he's at, it turns out that the young man got swindled. Asking a nearby gambling hall if they've seen the thief, he's met with opposition when he tries to leave. Provoking Matahachi into drawing his sword, the samurai's pride leads to a declaration of his new identity. Slicing the leg of one of the gamblers, Matahachi notices the acquaintance watching from the crowd. Chasing him down, the cornered man is ready for a duel. Initially thinking of the fame from Kojiro's defeat, the man instead wants to steal the famous name for his own use. The two get ready to fight, but fear starts to invade Matahachi's senses. Realizing that the prestigious name has already been stolen, the thief wants his opportunity for an easy life. Panicking during the duel, the young man thinks back to his time in the village with Takezo. Remembering how he was the only one who could take on the skilled fighter, he's filled with a new wave of confidence. Projecting the image of his friend onto the opponent, Matahachi isn't the least bit worried anymore. Using excellent form, the battle ends in an instant. Coming back to the gamblers, the samurai shows off his trophy, scaring off any would-be challengers. Following this encounter, Matahachi is offered a free stay at a couple's house in exchange for his protection. The man accepts, ready to use his reputation for other desires. With his arrogance beginning to build, and his sense of entitlement being ever-present, Sasaki Kojiro is ready to start his new life. While Musashi moves on from his battle with Inshin, Kojiro has remained with the duo that took him in for protection. Using just his name as a deterrent against thugs, things have remained quite peaceful for the three of them. The woman of the house is now obsessed with Kojiro, but he's starting to lose interest, as his ex-lover left quite an impression on him in bed. Going into town, his reputation is now far more apparent than it was before. While certainly uneventful, Kojiro is quite enjoying this easy lifestyle. Stopping nearby for some alcohol, a stranger approaches him with a request. Wanting to test himself, the man is looking to fight the established swordsman. They head elsewhere to duel, with Kojiro noticing that his opponent may prove to be troublesome. Making a quick decision, he pushes the challenger and his assistant over the edge of a steep hill. Blending in with the crowd, Kojiro is contemplating his next move. Not paying attention, he accidentally bumps into an older woman. 
With one brief look, Kojiro realizes that this isn't just any old woman. It's too late to conceal himself, however, as his mother recognizes him instantly. Not interested in reconnecting, Kojiro makes a break for it. Thinking quickly, his mother calls out that a thief is escaping, putting a stop to his getaway. It seems the man's uncle came along with his mother as well, currently attempting to dissuade her from punishing the embarrassed son. The old woman wants an explanation, to which Kojiro says that his regret was too painful to come back home. Recalling his activities over the last five years, it amounts to little more than selfish behavior and an unfortunate accident. Being questioned about his nice appearance, the son claims to be an accomplished teacher of the blade, going on to show his certificate as proof. Wondering about the different name on the paper, he states how he took the alias out of consideration for the family's history. Later that night, the three celebrate their reunion as a family. Kojiro learns about his mother's goal to get revenge on Takezo and Otsu, becoming curious about his former fiance. Desperate for a chance at returning to his old life, the son is ready to drop everything, until he hears that she left the village with Takezo. He's shocked by this news, but doesn't know that they've barely spent any time together. Hearing the backstory of the duo's departure, Kojiro is given a skewed narrative, making him jealous of his old friend. Nearby samurai overhear the conversation about Musashi, adding more fuel to the fire. Becoming prideful once more, the swordsman asks the others if they know of his greatness. Making a bold declaration, Kojiro vows to eliminate Musashi in the near future. While the trio travels around together, Miyamoto infiltrates the Yagyu estate, getting a lesson in the meaning of true strength. As he continues to train himself, Kojiro has done the opposite, going from place to place without doing much of anything. Tired of the extra company, the swordsman is looking for any excuse to leave. His uncle notices this, also making the astute observation that despite his nephew's brave words, he doesn't actually care about getting revenge against Musashi. The uncle's suspicion continues to grow, wondering how Kojiro's reputation amassed when he hasn't even seen him lift a sword while in their company. Knowing his nephew from years of growing up, he just isn't convinced that the young man is as formidable as he says. This accusation is the breaking point for Kojiro, running off to resume his fabricated life. Declaring his name out loud, two men nearby take notice. Blindly heading into a decayed forest, the swordsman loses track of where he is. It's here that he runs into the men he passed earlier. Kojiro slowly realizes that the samurai in front of him is the challenger he pushed off the hill back in his old town. Assuming the reputable man is there to have a duel with Torajiro of the Chain and Sickle, Kojiro doesn't miss a beat, confirming his suspicions. The samurai then goes on to correct himself, saying how the master is actually Shishido Baiken. Kojiro fell right into the man's trap, now forced to deal with a dangerous situation. The opponent is ready to go, but Matahachi is hesitant to begin the fight. Having his hand forced, the imposter tries to motivate himself by again picturing his friend over the enemy. Unfortunately, this tactic has the opposite effect now, as he's still consumed by jealousy. Nervousness starts to take over, with no tricks to help him this time. Matahachi proceeds to swing wildly at his adversary, giving him the brief opportunity to retreat. During this encounter, the young man's uncle came into the forest to locate his missing nephew. Looking around the area, the older man is now very much aware of the imposter's true nature. Finding the swordsman just before the fight starts, he's ready to prevent his foolish family member from getting killed. Jumping in to help, he's blocked by the challenger's assistant. The uncle manages to land a clean blow on the other man's arm, but unfortunately, his sword gets stuck. With one blow, the old man is cut down. Falling to the ground, his consciousness fades quickly. With the last of his energy, he wishes for Matahachi's safety, as his sister's pride and joy is her son. Still being chased by the samurai, the imposter is sick of his pursuer's self-righteous attitude. Suddenly, the two notice a girl watching from nearby. Matahachi isn't impressed, but the other man takes note of the weapon she's carrying. Forgetting about the annoyance behind him, the swordsman runs off to track down the person related to his visit. Not waiting for him to change his mind, Matahachi takes advantage of the distraction to run. 
A sudden vision of Musashi causes him to lose his footing, bringing him to the ground. With dirty clothes and shattered ego, the imposter is forced to reflect on his cowardice. The apparitions continue to sling insults as Matahachi rises back to his feet. Throwing his certificate in anger, he's tired of being looked down on. Still craving approval, the Ronin refuses to lose to his friend. Desiring a chance to prove himself, he makes his first target the man that left him in favor of the girl from earlier. Regrettably, he's too late, as Shishido Baikin got to him first. Instead of fighting, Matahachi is now given the duty of gravedigger for all of the fallen warriors nearby. Sickened by the dangerous man's power, the weak samurai has no choice but to carry out the task. Backtracking for a period, Matahachi eventually discovers the corpse of his uncle. Overcome with fear, he calls out in vain for his remaining family member. The exhausted man remains outside until sunrise, not yielding any results. Thinking back to the time in his original village, Matahachi recalls a conversation he had with his uncle in regards to striking out on his own. The older man isn't impressed with the idealistic talk, stating how the nephew already has a great life planned out for him. The teen doesn't want to throw everything away, but has the nagging feeling that staying in the village will lead to stagnation. Understanding the desire to become something more, his uncle lightens up, encouraging the personal journey. Coming back to the present, Matahachi is all alone. While the young man had decent intentions with his lie, it came back to bite him in the worst way possible. Hearing someone else approaching, it doesn't take long for him to recognize Musashi's face. Not wanting to see him, the coward runs off into the distance. Feeling his imposing aura, Matahachi is again humbled by the gap growing between them. Later watching Musashi's match against Shishido, the lone spectator is left in awe at their skill. Regardless, he wants to take a necessary step forward, still haunted by the day he abandoned his friend. Viewing the conclusion of the fight, Shishido is dealt a final blow. The young girl in his company is shocked by the outcome, throwing her own sickle at the winner. Although Miyamoto is fully aware of this, the attack gets unexpectedly blocked with someone else's sword. Dashing out of cover to receive his thanks, Matahachi is instead met with anger. The swordsman already knew about his trespassing, appalled that the mystery man would go as far as involving himself. Initially wanting to reveal his identity, he's now decided against it. Despite his desire to make things even, the favor was seen as intrusive, and he isn't welcome here. With no good deed going unpunished, the young girl throws a blade into Matahachi's back. In retaliation, he throws her sickle back at her, being blocked by Shishido's quick maneuvering. Wondering if they somehow still have the same bond as before, Matahachi leaves the trio to their business. Many months pass, bringing Musashi back to Kyoto for his duel with Denshichiro. As the crowds buzz with anticipation, another man is enjoying a cup of sake elsewhere. Across the room, a samurai takes note of this, offering a friendly apology for staring. Using his fake name, Matahachi runs the same endorsement scandal that he experienced firsthand. Mentioning the fee for getting the man a job, the swindler has fallen to a new low. Wandering through town, he uses some of the money to hire a prostitute. At first, Matahachi enjoys himself, but it doesn't take long before countless people run through his mind, including the mother he never located. He's more or less back to his old lifestyle, but with no real bonds to speak of and no goals accomplished, the imposter couldn't feel more hollow. Waking up in the middle of the night, the man recalls a memory from his past. As a kid, another woman of the village told him how his mother wasn't actually related to him. Potentially being someone else's son, he's not sure how genuine his familial connection really is. Going on to think about Otsu, he always knew that the former fiancé was more interested in Takezo. Matahachi comes to the painful conclusion that his world is his alone. Upset with this fact, he gets up and starts a chilly walk to Kyoto. Even if it means ridicule, he desperately wants to see someone that knows his true self, and not his alias. Before arriving in town, Musashi has his deadly duel with Seijiro, head of the Oshioka. Now in Kyoto, Matahachi becomes confused at the number of clan members frantically searching for someone other than him. 
Hearing a rumor from the innkeeper, the man is utterly shocked at the heights his friend has climbed to. Deciding to get some food, Matahachi continues to hear talk of Musashi from others around him. Jumping into the conversation, the swordsman is looking for more praise to stroke his fragile ego. However, before he can finish stating his name, a single line of information freezes the imposter's advance. Thinking quickly, he adds a single letter to his surname to keep the others from getting suspicious. While the men write it off as a joke, Matahachi is dumbfounded by this new knowledge. Running out the back to avoid being seen by Denshichiro, the criminal is starting to regret his visit. Stopping somewhere else for alcohol, Matahachi is confused by Kojiro's steadily increasing reputation. Drinking excessively, the man gets agitated while comparing the lifestyles of him and Musashi. Causing a scene, he brags to the owner about who he is, putting Miyamoto down in the process. Being far too loud, he catches the attention of the Oshioka, who just so happened to be looking for Kojiro. Attempting to disguise his name again, the clan members are skeptical. Unfortunately for the drunk man, it doesn't take long before they recognize the fugitive that set fire to their dojo. Punishing the man out in a field, the new bruising helps to confirm his identity. Wanting information, they assume something is going on between the two if he's posing as Kojiro. Telling the member what he assumes to be the truth, it only invites more intense beatings. Suddenly, two people approach the group from another direction. The head member yells fiercely at them, affecting only one person. The real Sasaki Kojiro finally makes an appearance, leaving the fake Kojiro amazed that he actually exists. The Oshioka aren't sure if the stranger is the real deal, attempting to size him up at a glance. Meanwhile, Matahachi is finally putting all of the pieces together. The man he witnessed getting beaten to death wasn't actually Kojiro, but a messenger meant to deliver a certificate to Kojiro. Feeling a wave of shame come over him, Matahachi is left in awe at the genuine article standing in front of him. The Oshioka member plans to test Kojiro's strength, then apologize while welcoming the swordsman into their dojo. Originally not planning on drawing his sword, curiosity gets the better of him, wondering how skilled the man with the gentle gaze really is. In mere moments, the older man is put down. Matahachi now sees exactly why his reputation is so great. He starts to shake, not out of fear, but because to him, this samurai is the epitome of what true strength is. Failing to get the swordsman's attention, the remaining Yoshioka members instead decide to take revenge for their fallen friend. Kojiro makes quick work of the first samurai, heading over to deal with the second. Before he can reach him, Matahachi gets in between the two, begging Kojiro to stop. He frantically tries talking to the deaf man, unable to properly communicate. Perhaps only to himself, Matahachi declares that defeated men are still human, asking for them to be granted what little self-respect they have left. Putting his life on the line, he wants to believe that Kojiro somehow understands. Seeing the heartfelt expression on the man kneeling before him, Kojiro decides to let things go, putting his sword back in the sheath. Matahachi is touched that his idol was willing to listen, also getting an apology from the remaining Yoshioka member. Always being one to take advantage of an opportunity, these developments give him a promising idea. Walking straight into the lion's den, Matahachi brings Kojiro right to the Yoshioka's dojo. The members aren't happy with the current situation, ready to eliminate the two intruders. That is, until the surviving member that came back with them reveals that Kojiro is in their presence. Now having the upper hand, Matahachi has taken it upon himself to act as Kojiro's interpreter. Despite his downward spiral, the self-appointed translator is again ready to make a name for himself, one way or another. Despite the member's objections, Matahachi stands his ground, knowing the potential of his plan. Having his eyes on even greater possibilities, the interpreter is still determined to become greater than Musashi through Kojiro. More than anything, he wants the shame that's been clinging to him for so long to be washed away. After a bit of time, the other members finally recognize the criminal standing in front of them. The Oshioka become furious, ready to gang up on the lone man, but a voice outside the group calms things back down. One of the top men remembers Kojiro from a past encounter, requesting for an exchange of techniques from the translator. 
This doesn't sit well with certain others present. Striking down Matahachi, most of the men still want revenge for their fallen comrades. After some fighting breaks out between them and Kojiro, the one currently in charge interrupts by kneeling an apology to both the famous swordsman, as well as his interpreter. Thanks to this, Matahachi finally has his chance. Agreeing to talk with the deaf samurai for them, the opportunist reminds the group that the two operate as a single unit. While putting on a convincing act, Kojiro isn't exactly a fan of the annoying man's gestures. Additional pressure gets added when the Yoshioka requests a demonstration of Matahachi's abilities. Stalling for time as he thinks, the interpreter claims that the duo will communicate mentally. As his own internal wishes fail to reach the swordsman, the members quickly begin to lose their patience. Making an animal with his hands, Matahachi tries to elicit any sort of reaction from Kojiro. Getting his hands swatted away, the translator supposedly confirms the deaf samurai's feelings. Claiming that Kojiro hates the Yoshioka, Matahachi relays the man's complete denial. Ready to leave the dojo, the interpreter is surprised to see Kojiro grabbing his sword from their collection. Wanting another match with his old acquaintance, the swordsman presents the blade to the kneeling man. The offer is humbly refused for the time being, leaving Matahachi to salvage the situation. Kojiro starts to dish out additional abuse to his bothersome companion, giving the translator more ground to stand on. Negotiating a variety of things to appease the deaf swordsman, the Yoshioka eventually agree to the request. The duo spends the night at the dojo enjoying various refreshments. Left alone for a bit, Matahachi wonders if Takezo still considers him a friend. Contrasting the negative feelings he gets thinking about him, the interpreter feels perfectly comfortable with his new companion. Suddenly, the man remembers the certificate he's been meaning to deliver all this time. Looking down at the scroll, Matahachi hesitates to let it go. If he gives the item up and things go poorly for him, he'll be left with nothing. Deciding against it at the last minute, the drunk man acts like nothing happened. Getting up for a bathroom break, one of the Oshioka tells Matahachi that he can only enjoy himself until a certain face-off happens. Asking the man to clarify, he reveals that Kojiro is meant to be a proxy fighter for Denshichiro, as the members don't want their new leader going against Musashi. Becoming nervous with this information, Matahachi realizes that he's in another dangerous situation. The upcoming duel has no place for either samurai to go after winning, with the Oshioka able to use their reputation to shift the event in their favor. The interpreter also knows that he'll be dealt with once the match concludes. He unknowingly guessed correctly, as the clan had deemed the two guests expendable from the start. Not wanting his two friends to fight, Matahachi tries to warn Kojiro, but it seems that the deaf swordsman has already decided to move on. Following suit, the former interpreter leaves the dojo with no resources left. Despite all of his earlier insults and declarations, Matahachi is still worried about his old companion. This anxiety is soon directed elsewhere, as members of the Oshioka followed him when he left. Attempting to run, the man is quickly captured and harshly beaten. The jig is up, and Matahachi has nowhere left to run. The next morning, the duel between Musashi and Denshichiro is finally about to start. While this is going on, Matahachi is receiving more punishment, having been dragged back and imprisoned by the Yoshioka. Antagonizing his attackers with insults, as well as embellished personal stories, the foolish man invites himself to get nearly beaten to death. With his consciousness fading away, the last of Matahachi's ambition starts to dissipate. The men responsible for the abuse report the last moments of the criminal's life, finally rid of the annoying samurai. At least, that's what happened as far as they're concerned. Somehow, the prisoner managed to escape, with a small group of Yoshioka members desperate to keep it a secret. Ordering his alcohol of choice, the battered swordsman drinks while hearing the usual gossip about Musashi. Leaving without paying, the man wants nothing more than to reunite with Kojiro for his personal gain. Lost in thought, he's shocked to look back up at a familiar face. Immediately running away, he quickly gets cut off by Musashi. The two grab some food, and while it takes a bit of time to open up, the friends are soon laughing together like old times. Hearing about his mother after so long, Matahachi is surprised to learn just how close she is. Reminiscing about the past, 
The man without connections is brought to tears, finally able to talk with someone that truly knows him. Still caught up on being famous, Matahachi weakly congratulates his friend on his accomplishments. Not particularly caring about that side of things, Musashi comments how he still has plenty to learn. While the samurai is coming from a place of humility, Matahachi views it as being left behind even more. He becomes furious, raising his voice to berate the swordsman that doesn't seem to understand what he's done. Musashi isn't necessarily offended by these remarks, but the scene does get them kicked out. Walking outside together, Matahachi wonders where Otsu currently is. Going too far, the man drunkenly inquires how their time together has been, getting a very noticeable reaction out of Musashi. The next morning, Matahachi is by the river, tending to a newly swollen eye. Getting the answer he had been wondering about, he fully understands the awful mistake he made. Soon after Musashi's battle against the entirety of the Oshioka, Matahachi is found drunkenly wandering through the forest. Discovering the nearly dead Musashi lying on the ground, he quickly picks him up to find help. Arriving at a temple that Takawan happens to be staying at, the monk goes to work patching the samurai up as best he can. Sitting by the unconscious man, Matahachi notes how there isn't any way he could ever match up to him. Falling asleep, the good Samaritan wakes up to his first encounter with Otsu in years. Only interested in the state of Musashi, the other man gets pushed aside without a second thought. Being kicked out of the room for the time being, Matahachi finds out that Otsu hasn't been traveling with Miyamoto after all. The former couple talks for a bit outside, with the conversation not going particularly well. Matahachi notices the difference in their relationship, very much aware of the wall he willingly chose to build between them. Seeing how the woman looks at Musashi, he knows that things are truly over. During dinner, Matahachi encourages Otsu to stay with the swordsman, telling her not to suppress her desires. Leaving the dining hall soon after, the former fiancé is content with his way of making amends. He goes back to sit with Musashi, reflecting more on his life decisions. Dejectedly, the man wishes that he wasn't so hopeless. He thinks back to his insensitive comment about Otsu, knowing it's best if they stayed away from each other. He also mentions how he would have felt worse if the swordsman let him off without being checked. Making a request for Musashi to take Otsu with him, he passes out, with the woman in question overhearing the nice sentiment. Another night comes, with Matahachi saying how Musashi had always made him feel anxious. Wondering if the swordsman will finally take it easy after this, the lone visitor remains concerned. Checking on the heartbeat of the unconscious man, Matahachi hears the intensity still erupting from within. The beating sends him back through countless memories, remembering how full of life the wild companion was. Matahachi learned so many things from Musashi's journey, and despite everything he said or did out of jealousy, he knows that deep down, they're still friends. Leaving the next morning, the wandering man is ready to pursue a goal that can still be salvaged. Wanting to reunite with two people he cares about, he's determined to locate Kojiro, as well as his mother. Going back to his original appearance, the man has finally shed his false identity, and is ready to exist as Matahachi. The son goes around town asking the villagers if they've seen his mother anywhere. Hearing about a woman that haggled with someone rather intensely, Matahachi knows that she couldn't be anyone but his mom. Heading to where the older lady is staying, the man thinks on how he lost himself through the twists and turns of his life. Resolved to commit to the new role he's assigned himself, the son is finally reunited with his mother. Unfortunately, she's become increasingly sick in the time he's been away. Allowing her to rest at a nearby temple, Matahachi procures a number of things to help the woman recover. He then goes on to say that after she gets better, the two of them can return to their original village together. The priest in charge is very accommodating, though he's also aware of Matahachi's strange situation to some degree. This is thanks to the older woman who eventually saw through her son's exaggerated stories. Matahachi is tempted to run away, but manages to stave off the urge. The priest soon leaves to find a doctor, leaving the family members alone. Confusing Matahachi for the other man, she reveals her honest feelings. Not caring about the lies, his mother only wants things to work out favorably for the son she loves. As the day ends, the visiting doctor isn't optimistic about the old woman's health. Having overworked herself searching for Matahachi and Takezo, 
the son is told to make the most of the time she's got left. Carrying the mother on his back, Matahachi is ready to return to the village before it's too late. Recalling his previous experiences surrounded by lies, the son is sick of the individual he grew into. His mother interjects, telling him that while he isn't necessarily a strong person, he can still be someone that imitates that strength. Getting a small flashback, we see that the older woman lived with this in mind. After her husband died suddenly, she was all alone in the village. Desperate for the chance to continue her bloodline, she begged another woman for the opportunity to be the child's mother. Faced with ridicule and hardship, she continued to use her life solely to take care of Matahachi. Both family members lived with their share of lies, but they still did their best to act strong in spite of that. Admitting all of the countless fabrications to his mother, the son has finally laid everything bare. With that, he's ready to finally end things. Standing by a fierce waterfall, Matahachi has made up his mind. The old woman is fine with whatever the outcome is, holding steady to her son's back. He counts down before jumping, but can't bring himself to do it. Again being ashamed of his weakness, he notes how getting rid of the lies leaves him hollow, scared for that to be seen by anyone. His mother continues to encourage him, saying how the growth has already started. She goes on to explain how it's not often that people manage to stick to a singular path, getting distracted by various factors. However, it's because of this that more opportunities can arise. Finally, Matahachi realizes that he doesn't have to be as great as Musashi. All he has to do is be true to himself. After a long journey, the two reach the village, coming home to where they belong. At least, that's how the old woman perceives it. Not getting very far at all, Matahachi's mother couldn't hold on any longer. Given more than he could have asked for, the son now has a debt he'll forever be forced to shoulder. Coming back to the temple, Matahachi decided to forego the rest of the journey. Staying the night, the son clears up the rest of what he couldn't get out to his mother before. The next morning, Matahachi digs a grave with the help of the priest. Regardless of his origins, the man knows who his true mother always was, sending her off one last time. In the following days, Matahachi helps the priest with various chores around the temple. Inquiring if the young man might become a priest himself, he writes the idea off as he remembers his past. He's told it's not impossible, as there's always room for change. Thinking about the one thing he's still able to do, he pulls out the certificate meant for Kojiro. Making it his mission to properly deliver it this time, Matahachi gets on a ship, headed for Kokura. In the later chapters, Matahachi is shown briefly reuniting with Kojiro. There are also a few chapters featuring a much older version of the man, telling stories about the famous samurai to make a living. Outside of these minor developments, this is currently where the character's story comes to a close. While Musashi still has unfinished business, I'd say that Matahachi's arc is mostly complete. This is only a guess though, as I haven't read the novel based around these events. Then again, I could see him getting more involved, especially with a certain someone trying to gain control of Kojiro. Regardless, Matahachi's story is a very interesting contrast to Musashi's life. The swordsman is determined to become stronger, training at every opportunity, and thrusting himself into deadly duels. While he does gradually get what he wants, a variety of experiences humble Musashi to the point of questioning his actions. Eventually, power doesn't matter. Instead, he decides to improve his technique for his own satisfaction, while also recognizing the value of life. Through everything, Musashi learns to slow down. On the opposite side of things, Matahachi desperately wants to make something of himself like his friend. He has lofty goals, but the main problem lies within his motivation. Whenever he runs into problems, his first instinct is to escape. He never wants to put in the work to properly accomplish anything, taking the easy way out whenever possible. Being more interested in freedom and personal pleasures, Matahachi discourages his own progress. He runs off with another woman, takes on a completely different identity, and gets many harsh reminders that poor choices have their consequences. Unbeknownst to him, this actually showcases one of his strengths. Matahachi is incredibly flexible and has impressive adaptability. Despite the type of situation he finds himself stuck in, he always manages to think on the fly. 
Of course, the rate of his success varies from place to place. It seems he eventually realized his potential as a storyteller, pacing things out in the best way to make a profit. If he had believed in himself more, there are any number of things he could have done. Unfortunately, fame was everything to him, determining a person's worth in his eyes. This is one reason why Kojiro leaves such a huge impact on Matahachi. Throughout his travels, the weak samurai constantly hears rumors about his friend's greatness. Having seen plenty of the man's fights with his own eyes, Matahachi knows that the likelihood of these stories being true is high. This leaves him feeling dejected until he gets a hold of Kojiro's certificate. Wanting just a taste of prestige, the name he randomly found ended up showering him with praise. People follow the exploits of Musashi, but no one really knows what Kojiro is up to. With only a title, the reputation of the mystery man leaves Matahachi constantly curious. When he finally sees Kojiro with his own eyes, the impression is massive. Despite carrying himself in a calm fashion, the dormant power of his technique is devastating. Watching the swordsman brings Matahachi back to his time in the village with Musashi. He never wanted to be left behind, but seeing his friend's huge leap in strength, Matahachi gradually became afraid. The one he used to recognize turned into more of a stranger with the passing days. With these things in mind, his dream of being on the same level could never be possible. However, it's a different story with Kojiro, as he's the exact opposite of the Musashi that the weak samurai knows. Kojiro isn't particularly intimidating. Rather, his demeanor invites other people's company. He has a gentle gaze that cuts through even the toughest person's soul. Not saying much at all, anyone can feel that they have an understanding with the swordsman. Embracing a more playful side of himself, it becomes almost impossible to think of this man as a killer. Regardless, Kojiro is just that. Being extremely fond of the sword, he stands among the top ranks of skilled samurai. All of these factors help Matahachi come to an important realization. If Musashi is the night, then Kojiro is the day, shining brightly for all to see. In this light, Musashi is now the shadow of Kojiro. With Matahachi being terrified of living in Musashi's shadow, it only makes sense that he would aim to be in the shoes of the deaf swordsman. By the end of the story, Matahachi still admires Kojiro, but has better motivations for wanting to meet again. If he's lucky, the two may end up forming a slightly more genuine connection. Matahachi also acted as a catalyst in multiple situations, guiding or even saving certain characters unintentionally. A good example of this is him accidentally starting the Yoshioka Dojo fire, giving Musashi an entire year to train himself, rather than potentially dying then and there. However, there's one instance in particular where this had the opposite effect. When the two friends finally met again after so long, Musashi talked about still not being content with where he's at. From his perspective, he just started learning that there's more to the way of the sword than just power, not engaging in his duels for recognition anymore. Matahachi sees this as being left behind, thinking his friend is selfish for desiring more fame than he already has. Furious at his own weakness, he lashes out at the confused swordsman. After making the comment about Otsu, Musashi very clearly sees that Matahachi isn't the same as before. Consumed by his lust for better reputation, the fake Kojiro assumed the worst of Miyamoto, projecting his own behavior onto the swordsman. Spending one night with his old friend was enough for Musashi to understand the core of Matahachi's problems. From there, the samurai goes on to rationalize that he's done the same thing with Otsu. Saddened by this realization, Musashi's mental state gets slightly weaker, leading him to jump into his reckless battle with the Yoshioka. While hard to deal with, these developments eventually brought Miyamoto to a better state of mind. It's unfortunate, but Matahachi caused hardship for a variety of characters, not learning until it was too late. Promising to change multiple times, it didn't take long to fall back into his old ways. Obsessed with fame, he became preoccupied with a single leaf. Everyone is free to live life in whatever way they see fit. Tell a few lies, cheat to get ahead, and use every opportunity for an advantage. Just be careful. Not only might the end results be unfulfilling, but you may also find a wave of bad karma ready to pay you back. Hey there. If you made it to the end, thank you very much for watching. 
This has been part two in a series of Vagabond story breakdowns. If you'd like to support the author, the original volumes, as well as omnibus editions are openly available to buy. Hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time. Peace, peace, guys.